And so good evening again. I hope that I've managed to calm down a little bit uh, since the last live video. Um, now that the news is out there, um, uh, I would sort of open myself up to the opportunity to have a little bit of a chat about it and to maybe answer some questions that you might have, uh, if you have any. Um, so the news, as you've probably seen, hopefully you have, uh, because of the way Facebook works, um, new posts on the Mythical Ireland page are not shared with the 53,000 people who like the page. Um, they, uh, they tend to be shared sporadically uh, to a certain number of the followers. But anyway, if you haven't seen the earlier posts, uh, and especially the one with the YouTube video, um, the announcement this evening is that my first book, Island of the Setting Sun in Search of Ireland's Ancient Astronomers, is being republished this summer. Uh, hopefully it will be available by May 2020 being republished by the Liffey Press as an anniversary or commemorative or uh, limited edition. Uh, it was first published in 2006 um, after uh, seven and a half years of dedicated research by myself and Richard Moore. Uh, it sold out very quickly in the space of a year and um, just over a year later, it was published at the end of 2006 and in early 2008, uh, a revised and expanded version of Island of the Setting Sun was published. That is the one that will be faithfully reproduced uh, for the uh, anniversary publication. It will have a new preface. Uh, there are a few little errata in it that I would like to put right. There's a few small errors that I, I would put right. I may, uh, we were, I was talking to the publisher, I, I mean, I, I want to re reproduce the cover, of course, but we may, we may swap out some of these smaller images just to give it a sort of a, uh, a new look. Um, so just to give you the sequence, uh, Island of the Sun was published in 2006, republished 2008. Just as it was going out of print, uh, Liffey published my next book, Newgrange Monument to Immortality, which was reprinted in, I think, 2016. In 2017, my book, Mythical Ireland, New Light on the Ancient Past, was published. It is, I suppose, if you wanted to think in terms of how these books fit in with each other, Ireland is the largest book in terms of word count and size and its breadth the amount of subjects that it covers and the thesis uh, that um, is contained between its covers. Newgrange was an expansion of the Newgrange section of the island where there were two chapters about Newgrange and Ireland. I felt that Newgrange needed its, its own book entirely. Mythical Ireland is the most comprehensive follow-on from Ireland of the Setting Sun. Many of the same themes uh, but new information. Um, so Island of the Setting Sun and Mythical Ireland would go very well together. If you were more specifically interested in Newgrange, uh, Newgrange Monument to Immortality might be the one. And then I suppose uh, the latest one, Drone Henge, is a little bit atypical in that it is more focused. It's more focused on this mysterious uh, monument that myself and Ken Williams found in, in the summer of 2018 at Bruna Bonia and several other monuments that we discovered, uh, but particularly this one, and talking about the discovery of it and the build-up to the discovery, and then, of course, trying to interpret. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not an archaeologist, so I'm not perhaps best placed to interpret monuments. Uh, so it's a little bit different, uh, but one thing that it does, I think, very well is it captures the journey from childhood when I first became interested in astronomy and when I first encountered the megalithic monuments of the Boyne, and the journey from, well, of course, the prologue is called A Love Affair with Henges, but uh, I, I think um, The Road to Discovery was a lovely chapter to write because it was all about childhood and then meeting Richard and, and 
researching Ireland and, and the discoveries that we made um, and the connections that we made. And, and, and I think the road to discovery in Drone Henge is a beautiful summary of how it all started and how it has led up to, you know, uh, one of the most significant archaeological discoveries of the past century. And I should briefly mention, as I did in the YouTube video, uh, my forays into fiction, my novella, Land of the Ever Living Ones, which you would probably read in uh, about, uh, if you're a fast reader, you probably read it in about an hour, maybe two hours. Uh, it's out of print. A uh, little bit of a thought about that in a moment. And my short novel, The Cry of the Sebok, uh, which is inspired by Irish mythology uh, and the two of the Danon, uh, and the story of Fintan Mac Bocra, who's the lone survivor of the flood because he turns into a hawk, you see, and that's where the inspiration for the story comes from. And I didn't market it that, that way, but, but I do think that The Cry of the Sebok is probably more aimed for a younger sort of a teenage young adult uh, readership i'm not really sure i i don't set about to write for a particular audience i think you no matter whether you're eight or you're 88 i think you'll enjoy it anyway i was thinking that at some point i could combine uh, my works of fiction into one volume because another book that i wrote beginning in 2018 uh, and culminating in february 2019 so i i started writing this book which is a synthesis it's it's mostly fiction but it's got a little bit of non-fiction it's got a little bit of autobiographical material in there it's got a little bit of what you might call um uh, you know um mm, documentary um prose in it but it's mostly fiction it's called return to segish and i wrote that before john Haynes was discovered and finished it afterwards and that book uh after being edited proofread proofread again is now with a literary agent and i'm keeping my fingers crossed crossed that he comes back and says yeah i think there might be a possibility to get this my previous works of fiction were self-published i'd really really love for my next work of fiction to be published mainstream so that would be uh, eight, uh seven books four non-fiction works all of this uh, all uh, of similar dimensions uh, all published by Liffey Press. Two works of fiction that I have self-published. One work of fiction that is finished that hasn't been published yet. And as of this moment in time, I have 10,000 words of my next book written. All I can tell you right now about that is that it is about astronomy and the stars. More specifically about astronomy than my previous books, uh, which featured astronomy as part of an overall or as, as one theme in an overall uh, work. So these are really exciting times. Uh, so I'm very excited tonight, as you can say, I'm very animated. Margaret, will you be having a relaunch and book signing? Yes, Margaret, I will. And the publisher was quite adamant about that because there's a whole new generation of people who are looking for Ireland of the setting sun. There's a whole new generation of people who've followed Mythical Ireland in the past five years who haven't been able to get island because it's sold out who came across mythical Ireland on youtube or on on facebook or uh through one of my later books and who are not aware of you know the breadth and the impact of Ireland. so it will be relaunched and there'll be a proper launch event uh probably in the boyne valley possibly here in drada and i will of course keep you posted about details linda nolan says congratulations thank you linda julianne osborne hello julianne uh lovely to see you again and uh yes you and i our friends on Facebook so I uh, I see your your posts regularly uh, and, and uh, I hope you're keeping well uh, Francis says good news well I'm glad you think so David Morgan hello David how are things with you um, I hope you've been up on the hills again enjoying yourself uh, excellent news says Julianne yeah well look I really hope that um, I hope that people uh, are, are, are able to get something from this you know I got a hell of a lot from it, a lifetime, a lifetime. And I feel, really, really feel at this stage, having been, been immersed in it now for 21 years, I really, really feel, I had to work that out, 1999. January 99 to January 2020 is 21 years, yeah. Um, I really feel that I'm still only scratching the surface. Maxine says, congratulations, Anthony. Thank you very much, Maxine. Jacqueline Kennedy Art 
look forward to reading them. Excellent. You, you're going to get more than one book. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, I hope you enjoy it. Nolan Proctor. Hello, Nolan, a regular uh, follower of Mythical Ireland. Uh, good evening to you. Vivian Trainer. Hello, Vivian. How's life with you? Hope you're keeping well. Myself and Vivian worked together. And actually, um, the Drawed Independent, where myself and Vivian worked together, uh, it gets a significant mention in the chapter of Drone Hinge called The Road to Discovery. There are several coincidences and things that happened uh, while I worked in the Drawhead Independent that were important to the overall story. So, Vivian, you might be interested in reading that. Uh, see the way I got a plug in for the book there. Uh, Margaret, thanks for sharing the journey. Well, very, very glad to have people to share it with, to be honest, because at the end of the day, you can write in a vacuum. Um, the biggest single challenge with, sorry, one of the challenges, one of the challenges of writing Island was writing a 100,000 word book in the space of six or eight months uh, at a time when my um, 2006, I had four kids at that stage and the eldest was uh, five going on six. Uh, the twins were three going on four and Tara was only a year old less than a year old so it was um manic times back then the other challenge of course was as a first-time author you're wondering whether you know you're passionate about what you're writing and you know you're trying to believe in it and you really you know believe in your heart that it's going to resonate uh, it certainly resonates with you personally and you think this is exciting stuff and you want to share the journey and there's always that feeling that when it gets out there people are going to be disappointed and people are going to read it and think it's rubbish and, and this is the doubt that every creative person has, every author, every poet, every artist and sculptor, every musician, whoever creates anything always worries that when they make it public, the public will go, don't like it, you know? Um, and I, I suppose I have grown in confidence since then, um, uh, due largely in part to the lovely, lovely, by and large, very warm reception that Island of the Setting Sun had. And I don't like to kind of say it because I don't want it to sound like it's but it's boasting, but but several people have said to me it's a classic and it should be in print. I've finally managed to convince my publisher, uh, David Givens and Liffey Press. I don't think he needed much convincing, to be honest. And I'm very grateful to him for supporting all my nonfiction work. Uh, I mean, I will tell you that in summer of 2017, um, I pitched the idea of Mythical Ireland to David, not knowing whether he would go for it because it seemed like a slightly hodgepodge synthesis of things, ancient megalithic sites, astronomical alignments, mythological and folk tales, um, which I suppose are, are the, the basis of Island of the Setting Sun and was a very great success story. But he grabbed it straight away and said, yeah, let's absolutely do it. And we spoke about how we would do it. And the one thing that uh, Mythical Ireland has as an advantage over Island of the Setting Sun is it uses more photos and it uses larger photos. Um, so it, it's a it's a full color book with lots of these lovely color photos in it. But anyway, I should mention David, uh, who's been uh, an ardent uh supporter of of my uh, uh non-fiction uh liffy press does not publish fiction so uh ethna is saying just came across mythical Ireland on youtube only last week download island the setting sun now we'll look out for your books thanks well there is uh, a kindle version of island of the setting sun available if you want to read it right now the kindle version is am i right is the first edition and the new publication of Ireland this year will be the second revised expanded edition. Ruth Goff has joined. Hello, Ruth. Uh, very nice of you to join us. And Ruth um, and myself, we know each other a long time. Uh, and uh, I were you at Newgrange at the solstice, Ruth? I'm not sure whether we saw each other there or not. If you anyway, forgive me if you weren't, and if if especially if you were and I didn't wave at you. Celine says great news. Michael Fox. Uh, Michael Fox, who's a tour guide and who runs uh, Newgrange.com and Boyne Valley Tours, is a long time uh, friend and I suppose companion of mine. We've been doing similar things for many years. Uh, Michael, hope you're 
uh, especially that your clients will be interested in the fact that Island of the Setting Sun is being republished. Hi, Vivian. Yeah, I definitely think you, you, you have to buy the Drone Henge book uh, if you haven't already done so. Um, and apologies if you have. I think you'll be very interested in the Drahad Independent Connection. Camilla, my 11-year-old daughter loves everything with Newgrange, Henge's astronomy, etc. Will def Defo get her the books? Well, that's brilliant, Camilla. Uh, Island of the Setting Sun will be at a little bit of a premium um, because of the size of it and the fact that uh, colour printing is expensive to do. I want to say something in that regard. When I approached uh, Liffey Press in early 2006 with this proposal for this book, Liffey Press had never published uh, a full colour book. And having discussed it uh, at length with myself and Richard, they said very quickly that this needs to be published in full colour. And so this was their first full colour publication. And I think it worked very well for them. And of course, it worked very well for us. They took a gamble and it paid off. Uh, and we're very grateful for it. Of course, all my non-fiction books with Liffey in the meantime have been in full colour. Roisin Dawson, another very regular commenter on Mythical Ireland. I have the original from way back when, looking forward to see the new, seeing the new one. Well, I'm just saying that if ever uh, you're stuck for a few bob, you could do worse than stick it on Amazon and put $500 on it, you know, but hopefully it won't come to that. Uh, and some things are uh, uh, more valuable than you can put a sum uh, or a figure on. Uh, Peter Stewart says, good evening. Hello to you, Peter. Neve Phelan has joined. Hello, Neve. And uh, Neve, um, it's not public, but Neve made... Uh, an audio documentary about Newgrange featuring myself and several others. Uh, Neve, if that's public, you might share the link. And if it's not, why the hell isn't it public? Because it's excellent. I'd really love to see that in public. Anyway, good evening to you. Margaret, your journey needed to be shared. It's absolutely needed. And there's that's Margaret Ring, another of the regular followers. And Kerem Gogus has joined us now. I need to make special mention of Kerem. Uh, Karam and I have never met face to face. We've been virtual friends on Facebook for many, many years. Since the first time that he produced, produced a 3D model of Newgrange, he's an artist who works with computer 3D graphics. Karam marvelously recreated what Dronehenge might have looked like and gave us an opportunity to see that. And his images are published in the Dronehenge book. Uh, he's a very, very gifted uh, 3D artist, and I'm very glad to call him my friend. And uh, Karen, your copy, uh, I'm not forgetting, will be in the post to you in the coming week. Um, so uh, I was just telling everybody that Island of the Setting Sun is being republished, Karen. Julie says, I won't be able to brag about my rare book anymore. You will if it's a first edition. Um, and I, and in fact, I still think you will be able to if it's a second revised edition, because the fact is that uh, if you've watched the video, you'll see that in fact the second edition copy uh, on uh, Amazon right now is much more expensive than the first edition. That's the opposite of how it normally is. Generally speaking, the first edition is not available for any cheaper than $500. And I've seen them for two and $3,000. The second edition is regularly somewhere around 150 to $200, maybe a bit more. Tracy O'Connor has joined. Hello, Tracy, good evening to you. And uh, we are on the verge of in bulk uh, and soon coming St. Bridget's Day, not forgetting that the winter is soon coming to an end. And that time uh, for uh, the, uh, the growth of all things is coming. Julie King, I needed another. I needed another copy for a friend, though, so I'm happy out. Well, if you watch the video, um, there is a copy on Amazon, or there was a couple of hours ago for nineteen less than twenty dollars, which or twenty euros, uh, which is an incredible bargain. So snatch it if you can. Uh, Jack McCarthy says, "Do you do tours of Newgrange? A few fellows from Cork interested? Yes, I do. So if you go to my website, uh, mythicalireland.com, and you go to the tours page." You'll see information there. Drop me an email. There's a contact page on the website. Drop me an email about it, and we'll try and organize something. Moira, Moira Ace Deneen says hi. Jack Rogers has joined. Hello, Jack. And Jack um, is a Boyne Valley man who has been very interested in 
uh, mythical Ireland's uh, pursuits over the last few years, Jack, I haven't forgotten that I have to go out to you and I'll be out to you soon. Uh, you know the way it is. Everything's busy, working, trying to write books and, uh, and all the rest. Uh, but looking forward to um, uh, seeing you and especially to having a look at the river. Uh, so that is all the comments up to date um, as of this moment in time. So just again to reiterate the big news of the evening, the uh, the largest of my books to date, uh, a Island of the Setting Sun in Search of Ireland's Ancient Astronomers, written with my good friend uh, and art and the artist from Drogheda, Richard Moore. There's our names there. It is going to be republished uh, no later than midsummer, summer solstice. Uh, hopefully in in May, hopefully before the end of May, if not sometime in early June. It's going to be largely a faithful reproduction of the second expanded revised edition of Island of the Setting Sun. It will have a new preface in it. I, I think I may swap out these small images on the cover, but I still would like to leave the iconic cover as it is. Uh, and as I was saying earlier, there are a few errata eh, contained in the book. Yes, I know, mistakes. And even I make them because I'm human. Um, and I, I would probably wish to correct a few little mistakes that are in it. Thankfully, thankfully they are uh, few and far, far between. Uh, so uh, I want to have more concrete details about it. I will let you know. Uh, myself and Liffey Press uh, will be working on... Um, you know, getting it all uh, print ready over the next couple of months, and hopefully, uh, we'll be on schedule to release it. Uh, the price will be thirty-five euros, uh, and uh, um, for those of you who will be ordering it online, I will be making available. Uh, I will take pre-orders before it's published, and those pre-orders will all be signed copies when it's available and when i'm able to post them but just be aware that postage from ireland is expensive so you will play you will pay a premium on top of the cover price moira ace Deneen says i live in slain too well slain has been very important to the whole story not just of ireland of the setting sun but to the whole journey um and it's no uh, coincidence that the hill of slain features on the cover of the book and there's a very important reason for that not just because it's a beautiful photo and do you ever notice the way the uh, the sun forms the dot on the eye well you know graphic designers they're very clever you know i think that was a lovely little um uh, uh touch shall we say julie king just on the tours do you take class groups uh, yes again i teach history and geography might take a class up uh, the art teacher my school teaches about the art at Newgrange so it might get a big group up yeah contact me contact me uh, on mythical Ireland at gmail.com Julie and we'll discuss that no problem at all um, yes I have worked with schools and I have worked have worked with large groups of children Karim says you're doing marvelous work dear Anthony top-notch well uh, Karim I'm very very glad to have been uh, assisted uh, so well by uh, the artists uh, Richard Moore and yourself and many other people who've contributed to the work over the years uh, and all I can say is please keep doing what you're doing <laughs> so Karen also um, brought back to life a monument that was actually almost completely erased from history uh, it was uh, Ireland's version of Stonehenge in fact it was called Ireland Stonehenge uh, it, it uh, existed uh, and was drawn in its full glory by Thomas Wright, an antiquarian and astronomer in the 1740s. But sadly, sometime uh, in the following uh, half century, it was completely obliterated. There's Wright's drawing of it, and that is the only record of this monument that we have uh, previous to its destruction. Kerem managed to make these beautiful 3D uh, recreations of it to show us what it might have looked like while it was still standing. And so that's why these works, sorry, I'm trying to find the other pictures of it. That's why these works are so valuable because they give us an insight into what something that is now vanished may have looked like uh, before it was demolished. 
and so these images are are, are Kerem's. So Kerem, yeah, you keep doing what you're doing, please. And Vicky Wallace, is it South Hall or Southall, or I don't know how to pronounce your surname. So if I've butchered it, I do apologize, but I know that you're a regular commenter. Uh, and the comment is lovely, <laughs> which is which is something we say in Ireland. Lovely, that's lovely, great, grand, you know, all good. Uh, so if there are no more questions, either the choices are I'll waffle on for another 10 minutes or you can ask more questions and I'll try and answer them. Uh, if not, uh, I could do a bit of reading, couldn't I? Well, that'd be very bold because that'd be kind of giving it away before, you know, a lot of you have never read it, uh, you know, you know, mm, I don't know. Yes, I don't know. Maybe I'll read a paragraph. Well, I'll read a paragraph just to give you a taster and hopefully I'll get like as a result of reading it, I'll get 25 people signing up for an advanced copy. Yes, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Maybe I'll just read something like the pre part of the preface. Yeah. So, so this is from the prologue to the original first edition. We are, all of us, children of the cosmos. It is unlikely that astronomy, whether in the form of pure scientific study of the heavens or associated with ritual and spiritual practices, began at any one location. But what is clear from our study is that the people who inhabited Ireland over 5,000 years ago were accomplished sky watchers. Their ritual astronomy appears to have been intrinsically connected with their belief in the afterlife, a stellar other world where the soul journeyed, pardon me, after death. The evidence for such knowledgeable stellar study encoded into mythology, place names, and the archeological remnants scattered throughout Ireland is widespread and overwhelming. People often say Ireland's Neolithic builders didn't leave us any writing, a form of textbook from which we can learn all about their culture and the reasons and methods behind their vast works. But the truth is they have left us an expansive record, deeply ingrained into their megalithic structures, carved onto their very stones, rooted in our extensive body of myths and stories and embedded in Ireland's place names. We invite, we invite you now to join us in examining that vast record on this incredible journey through the island of the setting sun. And that was written in Drogheda in November 2006, <laughs> 14, 14 years ago. My God, how time flies. Um, uh, so one of the things about Ireland is that uh, pretty sure it has the most comprehen comprehensive bibliography of any book that I've written to date. And it also has extensive uh, footnotes and references, just in case you're reading it and you're going, hmm, that seems a little bit speculative or that seems a little bit out there or that seems a little bit, you know, um, mm -hmm. I'd like to see the evidence for that. Well, you can follow the trail. Chapter 12, which is the largest uh, chapter of them all, uh, the one about the high man, contains 215 footnotes and references so there you go well referenced work a few more comments i think louise shaw says i make ceramics inspired by newgrange an amazing place love the place can't wait to see the book brilliant well don't forget to pre-order your signed copy <laughs> no but genuinely i hope that um you you uh, you get something from it and maybe it'll inspire you in your work um Kerem says he's very curious about my newest discovery. Um, are you talking about, Kerem, the medieval field system uh, in County Meath? Uh, I'm not quite sure which one. Uh, I hope this doesn't sound bad, but um, it's hard to keep track of them. <laughs> I, I know that National Monuments, the National Monument Service, right now at this moment in time, are updating the database with the uh, monuments that I discovered last year using Google Earth and Apple Maps. And they're appearing one by one or uh, 
uh, cluster by cluster. Um, there are, I think, 300 there. So that's uh, you'll have to forgive me for asking which one, but I assume it's the one. Hang on, let's see. Can I post a picture of that while I'm chatting live? I'm not sure whether I can do that with Facebook. It's only just giving me the smiley face emoji option. There's no actual, so I can't. But I might, um, if I get the opportunity, I'll post a picture of it later on so that other people can see what we're talking about. But I'm assuming that's the one you're talking about, the medieval field system. The wonderful thing about Ireland, as we've been discovering in the past couple of years, especially uh, as a result of the drought imagery from the summer of 2018, is that, uh, as I've always said, Ireland is a carpet, a mosaic of archaeology. You cannot move 20 yards in this country. I'm going to say meters, but let's use the old-fashioned terminology. You can't move 20 yards in this country without stumbling upon some archaeological monument or remnant. And the thing is that all of this stuff spans a huge, uh, 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 a huge amount of time. Uh, the earliest uh, surviving evidence of human activity from Ireland uh, is from the Mesolithic, from about 9,000 years ago, from about 7,000 BC. So we've Mesolithic and Neolithic, Bronze Age, Iron Age, late Iron Age, uh, you know, what we might call, uh, well, we used to call early Christian, um, uh, early medieval uh, uh, and late medieval and, and relatively modern stuff. Um, at the same, in the same period as Drone Henge was discovered, Drone Henge being probably about four and a half thousand years old, uh, some people flying a drone uh, in Bray found one of those era signs which were made for the Second World War to make sure that the if the German bombers strayed too far that they didn't drop their bombs on Ireland and that they knew it was neutral territory and that it wasn't uh, Britain that they were over. So you know there's the extraordinary possibility of discovering stuff that could be 9,000 years old or that could be 90 years old you know. Jacqueline Kennedy art Newgrange Tara and Lock Crew inspires me to create well uh, absolutely and those are areas upon which i have concentrated with my uh, written and photographic work we are so blessed to be here at a time of discovery i couldn't agree more and on that subject jacqueline when i was and again this is something i mentioned in the drone henge book when i was young uh, younger and i was a teenager and the books about newgrange and now have been published i was deeply deeply fascinated in fact I should show you the Nouth book. I was deeply fascinated in uh, 1986 when my father brought this book home, Nouth and the Passage Tombs of Ireland by George Ogan. And in its pages, I saw all these drawings and photographs and this information about the wonderfully adorned uh, stones and the passages and all of the fascinating information. And if you had told me back then, and this is something I've said often throughout the years, if you told me back then, you're going to write books about Nouth and Newgrange and these sites, I would have said nonsense. No, no, because all of the books have been written by the experts. Of course, years later, with the benefit of hindsight, I can say that while all of these works are fabulous, and of course, the archaeologists have, have done more than anybody to bring us up to speed with uh, what the monuments are about. The archaeology is not the, uh, the end of the story. Uh, it is not all of the story. Uh, so archaeologists don't have a premium on the interpretation of sites. Uh, they do have a lot of the information. But if they don't talk about mythology and they don't count uh, the stories about the place as being uh, evidence or information that might help in the interpretation, uh, then I feel that the interpretation is never going to be complete. And of course, you have to throw astronomy into the mix in order to get the full picture. But anyway, years later, it turns out that I've written lots of books about these sites and I'm continuing to enjoy the journey. What a treasure. Yes, Karen, you're absolutely right. And Margaret, Ireland is a rock art delight. Yeah, uh, I mean, in terms of megalithic art and in terms of rock art, um, it's, the, it's the place to be, isn't it? You know? Uh, there seems to be more here than anywhere else. Uh, there was something of a zenith, a cultural, creative, spiritual apex, you know, a high point. 
that was reached with the construction of the Brunabonia monuments. That has not been matched since. And in fact, there was quite a significant uh, change uh, in the types of monuments that were built after that. Um, and one could say that, you know, they're akin to the prehistoric early versions of the modern cathedrals, which are fabulous, fabulous works of labor and art, you know, uh, and which are not, uh, which which serve multiple purposes. They're not built for one particular purpose, you know, um, and we are very lucky. Well, I count myself as being very, very lucky uh, to be at the center of uh, this uh, wonderful landscape, because as I'm always saying, um, uh, Newgrange is located as the crow flies just over four miles in that direction. So, you know, my visits to Brunabonia are regular. I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to celebrate tonight's news by having a wee uh, tipple, a, 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 a small glass of wine. Um, I can get into my car and I can be at Newgrange in the evening time, or in the morning time, whenever. Uh, generally around 15 minutes from the time I le leave here. Now, it's not four miles by road. It's probably seven, something like six or seven miles by road, maybe even eight. Um, but I can be there in a short space of time. I'm very, very lucky to be on the doorstep of all of this, uh, which definitely helps. And of course, one of the most important parts of the story is the actual spending of the time on the ground to be there, to be able to enjoy the monuments and the landscape, to be there at those liminal times, at those twilight hours, to be there to hear the first bird song in the morning and to be to be there when the last robin or the last blackbird gives out its call in the evening as the stars appear um you know and the sun has gone down it's it's wonderful um and it's wonderful to know that you're you're in a space that has been sacred for a long long time and where distant uh, human ancestors uh, uh created these wonderful edifices these marvelous constructions uh, that they put their entire heart and their wholehearted labor into and that must have taken generations to complete i mean it's an extraordinary thing and i've covered that especially in the book about newgrange newgrange monument to immortality in terms of the materials they were using i mean you know on drone henge i asked connor brady the archaeologist to you know um Connor was a very uh, close advisor uh, on terms in terms of the archaeological uh, uh, facts uh, in the Drone Henge book, and I asked Connor, "Could you lay out for us if you're in the late Neolithic and you're digging these giant holes in the ground? Remember, the post holes for uh, Drone Henge are a meter and a half wide. They're generally a meter and a half to two meters deep, and there's several hundred of these post holes. Not to mention the ditch trench features." not to mention the huge array of monuments that there are mounds and cairns and and, and, and henges and linear features like like the uh, the cursus monuments etc and connor told me well the tools that they likely used were antler picks and cow scapula shovels and i don't know if any of you do gardening but um on the odd occasion I've had to do a bit of gardening and a couple of years ago we got rid of some of the grass in the garden and put gravel in instead you know even using a modern spade and you hit stone and it's like oh you know this has got this very percussive effect on your limbs when you're trying to stand on a shovel and push it down into the ground could you imagine trying to dig holes in the earth full of and and the earth at Newgrange farm where you know in front of Brunabonia in front of Newgrange uh, where, where these monuments were located is stony earth could you imagine doing that with tools that were made of antler and bone long before uh, well not that long but certainly before the uh, arrival of metallurgy and metal tools and everything that you you dug and all of the tools that you used including to you know to skin the animals that you ate and to cut them up 
you know, including, for instance, to cut down the oak trees or whatever type of trees were used as posts in all these monuments. That was all done with tools that were made of stone and bone and wood. And it's an incredible testament to the people who built these things. And we are absolutely in awe. And in my opinion, that awe only increases as the information about these sites uh, increases in volume. Yes, in some ways we're, we, we take the mystery out because we learn more, uh, but at the same time, the mystery increases all the time, uh, if that makes any sense. Moira says, I'm so poetic. <laughs> Yeah, and Tom, uh, no, in fairness, there is a, a lovely sort of poetic aspect to some of the prose that I write. Uh, it's, it's been described as a little bit poetic. Actually, um, what's his name? Ben, Ben Emmett from Astronomy Ireland, who interviewed me. I think it was the first interview I did when Ireland was published. He said that one of the things he said about the book was that it was poetic. So there you go. Uh, Tom Lawler says, well done, you deserve it. Well, thanks, Tom. And you're another of the long time followers and commenters on Mythical Ireland. Always good to see your comments. Jacqueline Kennedy Art again says that archaeologists digs to hold the truth. The mystic searches beyond it. Very good. Um, and I in Mythical in the Mythical Ireland book, I talked about the metaphor of Elkmar standing on Newgrange with the fork of white hazel, you know, and the the archaeologists with their divining rod, their, uh, their, not their divining rod, sorry, with their measuring pole, and how I considered that sort of like in opposition to the the druid or the poet's um, uh, symbol of divination, you know. Congratulations on your books. Nothing better to walk up Lock Crew with a flask of tea. You are a bard at heart. Yeah, I love Lock Crew. This is a really, really special landscape. So think of Brunavonia, everybody, but think smaller monuments, but in a, in, a, in a wilder, more rugged, higher up landscape with greater views over the surrounding landscape. It's fabulous, it really is. Kerem says, spiritual connection with the land and its history. I think that's a very important part of the story about Brunavonia. You know, you can't approach it purely as a scientist. You have to approach it with science and uh, poetry, mysticism, spirituality, cosmology. You have to uh, synthesize those things. You have to bring them together. Uh, what was it myself and Richard always say? Uh, myths and archaeology and astronomy. It's where stars and stones and stories come together that the true picture emerges or the full picture emerges. Margaret uh, says that Newgrange is so utterly amazing on the sites around it. Yes, the energies at the sites are truly life-changing. That connection needs to be remembered. Yeah, something I wrote in uh, Newgrange Monument Immortality was I wrote a chapter about how those people who had witnessed the solstice sunrise in the chamber, I wanted to get their reactions to it. And a great deal of people who've been in there and witnessed that event have found it to be a very uh, soulful emotional and in some cases life-changing event so it's very interesting so moira says i'm a mystic well i think humanity is mystical at heart yes we want to be measurers and scientists and we want to be archaeologists and we're fascinated by facts but if you've read jung cg jung believed that there was a mystical need in the human soul that 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 there's a requirement there that calls to be filled and that without that there is always a void in the human you know so i think you need to approach these things like alkmaar you know on the one hand yeah you're 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 you, you, the people who built new grange were undoubtedly master astronomers and they knew about stones and quarrying and they knew about transportation and they knew enough about um you know astronomy and uh, a little bit about engineering and surveying uh, for them to do what they did. Uh, but at the heart of it all is a transcendent mystery, which I believe to be connected with the greatest question that every human asks, which is what happens to us after all of this is done? What happens to us when we die? Is there something after? And I believe that enough people who have had near-death experiences were able to inform their community 
and maybe some of the shamans the druids who um who meditated who all who went into altered states who maybe uh, imbibed some psilocybin mushrooms or something um had these other world journeys or these journeys where they met the psychopomps or the ancestors and were able to come back to the community and say i want to reassure you that there is something and there's enough of doubt i think even in the most cynical modern human i think most people who profess to be atheistic are actually probably agnostic really deep down they're still wondering there's a part of them that says mm, yeah the facts tell me that i'm just going to die and you know I'm going to I'm going to go into a hole in the ground, or I'm going to be, I, I, you know, or I'm going to be cremated. And that's the end of me, and the story finishes at that point. But I think in in, in every human, uh, in some manifestation, whether only very, very, very slightly in there in the subconscious, hidden somewhere in a deep well of thought, or whether um, the person is wholehearted in their beliefs, there is this sense of wonderment and curiosity uh you know uh, uh, about you know that point and, and how will i know because if it's over it's over i just die and that's it and i won't get to think about it anymore but what if you know and there's the what if just that little thing you know nobody is truly atheistic uh i i i i, I just wonder about that anyway that's the personal uh, opinion uh, so i have no evidence uh, to support it uh, i call it a, a hunch but I, i'm not sure that anybody is truly atheistic i imagine that a great deal of people who say they don't believe in any god or deity uh, or any afterlife um, actually has a niggling doubt at the back of their mind dennis o'sullivan is in australia wow nice one dennis i wonder whereabouts you are i hope you haven't been close to the fires and i hope that everything's okay for you down there would love to visit sometime and as i said earlier would really truly love to see the southern hemisphere of the sky if you can hear a thing coming on and off here that's my little heater just to keep the uh, office warm moira i can feel those energies too a lot well it's a funny thing i don't um uh, palpably feel them directly uh, i i get a more sort of poetic sense of the energy of the place um, i see people who douse and i see people who you know who are very uh, in a meditative meditative state at sacred sites in the boyne valley region and i wonder about them you know i wonder what, what kind of connection are they making here and they say they're feeling things and they're saying their experience and energies I don't negate that and I don't want to put it down, but nor do I immediately latch onto that and say, oh, there must be something here. At the end of the day, all of these things are personal, you know, subjective. So uh, a lot of the things that I've written about in my books are from a subjective point of view. It's very difficult to be objective about spirituality and matters uh, that are, let's say, esoteric, uh, that are pertaining to mysticism of any kind. And of course, uh, I try to stay on the straight and narrow so that nobody can come along afterwards and say, you know, it's all uh, new age wishy-washy claptrap and all that sort of stuff, you know. Can't uh, disagree with you that the energies in Newgrange are amazing. Uh, I've had the opportunity over the years uh, to be there, not quite alone because they have to have um, guides, you, 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 you know, they have to have someone to supervise you. But almost alone and i've had the opportunity to be out outside newgrange at, at night and at twilight and it's an extraordinary place marie kieran's has joined hello marie i was talking to vivian trainer was watching earlier and i was talking about the uh, drahada independent connection with drone henge about how much how important it was to certain things uh, uh, if you get a chance to read the first chapter in particular um, and of course, I worked in the Drogheda Independent with you at the time when Richard Moore first walked into the office in January 1999 and asked if he could see Anthony Murphy. And that meeting began uh, what has ensued uh, the, the whole journey and uh, the writing of Island of the Setting Sun and everything that has followed. Margaret Ring says, John O'Donoghue would drink a little wine with you if he was still here. John O'Donoghue, what a remarkable spirit. What a remarkable human being. An angel long before he 
it departed the, the uh, carnal bodily form. Wonderful thoughts, Anthony, says Karen. I've always believed the universe is too big and complex just to disappear after death. Yeah, I was writing actually in the new book and I'm, I can't give too much away, but sure, look, you know, there's only 22 people watching, so it doesn't matter that much. In the new book that I'm writing, which is going to be astronomically themed, but is again going to have these mythological and mystical themes also. You know that the sun is located 93 million miles from Earth and it's relatively close to us. I think it's eight light minutes and 20 light seconds away. So the light that we're seeing, if you watch this, okay, it's dark now, but tomorrow morning when the sun rises and you watch the sun, the, the light that you're seeing in your eyes from the sun left the sun eight minutes and 20 seconds ago. The speed of light is almost 300,000 kilometers per second. It's 186,000 miles per second. And it still takes eight minutes, 20 seconds to get from the sun to us. If you could, so if you're in an aircraft and you're at cruising altitude and cruising speed, I'm not sure exactly what the figures are. You might be traveling at something like five or 600 kilometers an hour. Is that right? More, maybe. Is that miles an hour? Maybe 550 miles per hour. Forgive me about the figures. Anyway, just picture yourself cruising in an aircraft, right? And you're going at whatever it is, 0.8 of a Mach. You know, you're eight tenths of the way to light speed or to the, 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 the sound barrier. If you could magically fly out of the Earth's, Earth's atmosphere in your Aer Lingus Airbus uh, or your American Airlines Boeing, right? Or your British Airways Boeing, and you could fly straight to the sun, it would take you 19 years at cruising speed in an aircraft to get from the earth to the sun and remember the sun is our closest star and the next nearest star which is proxima centauri is over four light years away if you could find a way to travel at the speed of light which uh, einstein says uh, uh, material cannot travel at the speed of light uh, if you could find a way it would still take you four years to get there and four years back if you could get into your car in your driveway and drive straight to the sun, okay? Now, this is ridiculous, but just bear with me for a second. And you drove at a steady speed of 60 miles per hour or 100 kilometers per hour. Do you know how long it would take you to get to the sun? And it's just there. You can see it. You can feel the heat off it. You can see how it's creating growth in the grass and the flowers and the trees. It rises in the morning and it's a big orb sitting on the horizon. And you go, oh, lovely sun, sunrise. Look at that. Isn't that fabulous? Oh, lovely sunset, you know? Oh, look at Anthony's picture of the sunset at Newgrange. Isn't that lovely? And look, the sun is big. It's just over there, yeah? <laughs> well, if you could drive to the sun, at a speed of a steady speed of 60 miles an hour it would take you without stopping to refuel or to eat or whatever or to go to the toilet if you could drive steadily without stopping it would take you 177 years to drive to the sun from earth uh, so the reason the next book i think will be a nice synthesis of astronomy and maybe a little bit of uh, uh, mythology and mysticism is because the facts are always fascinating. Those facts are gripping. You know, they're really interesting. I always said to my friends when I was a youngster, uh, when we were out at twilight, and I'd say, lads, do you know when you see the stars appearing in the twilight, do you know that you're looking into the past? And they'd say, what are you talking about? And I would say, every star that you see the light that left that star left it some time ago. In the case of the closer ones, for instance, Sirius, which is the brightest star, I think it's eight, just over eight light years away. That light left that star eight years ago to get here. You can point to another star and say that's 100 light years away. You can point to another one and say that's 500 light years away. And then I could point to the Andromeda galaxy <laughs> and say that that is 2.5 million light years away. The light that you're seeing from that galaxy right now left that galaxy when we were still apes and when we were just beginning to use the first stone tools. Incredible. 
anyway, that's the new book, which I'm not going to talk too much about because that would be the subject of a separate video. And I need to get it written before I start talking about it. Uh, Margaret says the best time to visit the sites is just before dawn or just after sunset. Can't disagree with you. Most of my photography, a great deal of it anyway, is done at the golden hour, which is the first hour after sunrise or the last hour before sunset. And the blue hour, if the last hour before sunrise and the first hour after sunset. Eamon O'Brien says, hi, Anthony. Great news on the republication. Thanks, Eamon. I'm not sure if you've ever seen uh, Island of the Setting Sun. To this date, it remains my most substantial work and aided in no small part by my wonderful companion, uh, Richard Moore. Look at the faces of us. Look, we're so fresh faced and innocent looking. Look, look. <laughs> like that, I look, I look like I'm 17 in that picture, you know? No wrinkles, no blemishes. Anyway. Um, yeah, so uh, hopefully you'll enjoy it. Catherine Woodruff is in Wisconsin. Hello, Catherine. Love this topic from the archaeology astronomy to the vibes of each treasured ancient prehistoric site. Uh, yeah, well, we're on the same boat then. Absolutely. Couldn't agree with you more. Uh, and I wonder if you've had the opportunity uh, to visit. Margaret Ring says, I forgot to mention Ryanair. <laughs> I can imagine landing on the sun in a Ryanair plane. <laughs> <sighs> yes, and Karen points out something interesting, and that is that some stars may already be dead. Hmm? Well, yes. Uh, Betelgeuse, for instance. Uh, which is going to be a very, very strong topic in the in the next book that I'm writing at the moment. Uh, some people say Betelgeuse. Apparently, that's not right. For years, I called it Betelge Betelgeuse or Betelgeuse, and I was totally wrong. Uh, I'm told that the proper pronunciation is Betelgeuse from the Arabic Bet al Jews, which roughly translates as the armpit of the central one. So there you go. And Betelge Bet Betelgeuse, we now know, is located uh, about six, between 600 and 650 light years away and has been dimming significantly in the last few months and is much dimmer than it usually is, prompting people to wonder if it has reached the end of its life and if it is about to go supernova. Now, uh, many astronomers, expert astronomers, believe that it has at least another 100,000 years of its life to live, and it could actually go on for several more million years. Uh, a lot of people seem to be wishing for Betelgeuse. <laughs> Got to get the pronunciation right. A lot of people are hoping that Betelgeuse goes nova. I mean, it's short-term gain for long-term pain because after the nova is over and has faded from view betelgeuse is gone and orion is missing a star how could anybody celebrate that how could anybody be happy about that major theme of the next book anyway i'll say no more hard landing says margaret yes no in fact um uh, i think you would be incinerated quite a distance out uh, before hitting anything resembling a surface and i'm not sure that the sun even has anything that you could call a surface Joe Monks says, hi, Anthony, got to get you to sign my first edition. Just tuned in. Great chatting on the 20th. Oh, yes, Joe. I'll, uh, Joe, you're the guy who, who creates the works of those wonderful works of art. Yeah, it was lovely to chat with you at Newgrange on the 20th. Hopefully see you in Mouth next Wednesday. Well, I'll be there. I'll be with the I'll have the camera equipment, of course. I'll be looking to get a few more nice pictures of Mouth. Um, yeah, wonderful uh occasion that i'm glad to see them repeating it you know anyway it is two minutes to midnight um i've been talking uh, for the past three hours about mostly about island of the setting sun and if you've just joined us i just remind you that tonight's big news is that island of the setting sun which has been out of print since around 2011 is being republished this year will be available as some sort of a special commemorative or anniversary edition uh, before midsummer 2020 uh, so keep posted on mythical ireland facebook here and on the website of mythicalireland.com and of course on the uh, youtube page which is youtube.com forward slash mythical ireland for updates about when it will be available uh, and i will be uh, um, taking pre-orders um, uh, in advance of it 
being available um so you'll be able to get your name on a copy not quite sure what the print run is going to be at this moment in time i do know it will be limited um because it's look you can't get away from it it's very expensive to uh, publish full color uh, works like this uh, and they're very well worth it i can tell you because they just make such wonderful gift books and it has of course the french flaps you know uh, which gives it a sort of a more solid feel and it would be what you'd call a transition book sort of halfway between what you call a traditional paperback and a hardback it has that sort of heavier feel and it lo looks and feels lovely in the hand anyway i think i've done enough talking um if you have any other questions feel free to drop me an email mythicalireland at gmail.com or just keep commenting i'll try and catch up uh, with some of the comments tomorrow in the meantime it's been a lovely night and it's been lovely to interact with you i don't normally do these live uh, facebook broadcasts with the camera pointing at me i usually have the phone pointing at a monument like Newgrange or Douth or Nowth or Loch Crew or Tara. Uh, and usually you get to enjoy the scenery and the monuments, uh, if, uh, not uh, uh, looking directly at me. So uh, good night to all of you. And uh, hopefully the next time I do a live broadcast, we'll actually be out there at one of the monuments and we might have a little bit more information for you about what's coming. In the meantime, sleep well. To all of my friends in the States, uh, good afternoon to you all. I think it's seven o'clock in New York. Um, and to all my newly made friends in Princeton, um, I hope you're having a lovely time over there and hope it's not too cold. Pardon me. And to all my friends further west in the States, good afternoon to you. I hope you have a lovely day and a lovely evening. Uh, and it's been, as I say, a very, very exciting few hours for me. And it's been lovely to be able to share this announcement. And it's a long time coming. It's something I've been discussing with my publisher for the past year or so. And um, finally, we've made the decision that, yes, absolutely, this thing should be back in print again. And that there is uh, a new audience for it. And perhaps some of the people who have worn out copies. But I know one gentleman who told me he left his copy on a low bookshelf and one day his dog got at it and tore it to pieces. And so I know there are people out there who bought uh, maybe the first or second edition years ago who'd be looking forward to buying the new version and uh, hopefully you'll really enjoy it and especially to all the regulars you're you're lovely to keep up and to keep pace with everything um a special mention to the likes of roisin dawson karen gogus tom lawler margaret ring it's the names that i see popping up all the time commenting on uh my links and my photography and my videos etc etc uh, so so nice to see you all tom lawler if i didn't mention him already um there were a few others earlier vicky wallace southall i'm not sure if that's how you pronounce your name vicky i know i see that name quite regularly uh, and to all the rest of you thanks for dropping in very good night to you and please remember uh, to keep dropping in remember that facebook does not share everything that i share with you with the 53,000 people who like uh, the page. In fact, a lot of my posts are only getting shared to a very small uh, proportion of that. So in order to make sure that you're up to date with the news, you actually have to physically come to the page. If you're on your phone, go to your Pages app or go to Facebook and search for Mythical Ireland. Come to the page to see the updates. Don't be waiting for them to appear in your feed because quite often they don't. There's another option which I think is still available, which is when you go into the page, go follow first or see first, which means that my posts from Mythical Ireland will always appear at the top of your feed, a very handy function. The only thing is you can only have a maximum of 20 pages that you can follow, but sure, I'm sure many of you are following less than that. Anyway, I've spoken more than enough. I'm going to finish the old glass of vino and go to the bed with a hopefully a smile on the face and a happy heart, uh, thinking about how wonderful it's been to be on this fabulous journey of words and pictures and videos uh, how wonderful it is to have you folks to share it with and how wonderful it is to be able to hopefully continue that work. Good night to all of you and a very, very happy uh, Wednesday afternoon or Thursday morning, depending on where you're watching, from Mythical Ireland. <laughs>